Praise God. So we're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to read out of 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm going to read out of the NASB translation for this first couple of passages of scripture. I titled this message for tonight, I once was lost, but now I'm found. And it's, it never ceases to, it never ceases to, it never fails to cease to amaze me that things that happen during worship service, how Naya was singing about drawing us near. And I kept having over the last couple of days, the idea of nearness to God on my heart. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know that my message ended up exactly like I thought it was as I started to write it. But that, that's, a, that's a big part of what was on my heart whenever I began to put these, the Lord began to lead me to put these scriptures together. Nearness to God, intimacy with God, uh, the gracious gratefulness that we can have an intimate relationship with the Lord. Amen. And so here we go. Second Corinthians 11, 23 through 28. This is this is talking. This is the Apostle Paul talking right here and is explaining some of the things that he has been through since he's been the servant of the Lord. So um, are, here we go. It says, are they servants of Christ? I speak as if insane. I more so in far more labors. And far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent in the deep. What he's saying is, is that one of the times he was shipwrecked, he had to stay a whole night and a day in the waters, floating on a piece of wood like me. I have been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all of the churches. Father, I just thank you, Lord, for your word that you've given unto us. Holy Spirit, I need your help to present what you desire spoken. Lord, I pray that you would use me as a mouthpiece, Lord, that you would actually be the preacher and the teacher, and that you, Lord God, would fill your people, Lord, with your word, fill their hearts with your word, Lord God, let it have, let it effect change, Lord, in our lives, we need you, and we need the truth of your word to penetrate us, Lord, if you don't show up, Holy Spirit, and penetrate uh, our hearts with your word, Lord, then we've wasted your time, Lord, and I pray that, that we would no longer waste your time, oh Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. What would cause a man, you know, to, to leave his life that he had previous? Uh, he, he, you know, it's one thing, like, for someone like myself, I didn't really have anything. I'm just going to be honest with you. When the Lord found me, I didn't have nothing. Um, and when he called me, it was an upgrade immediately because at least I had a bed. To really, Literally, the first night I went to go to church, I didn't have anywhere else to live. My sister said, you can come stay here. We're going to church. I had a bed that night. Uh, but had, had she not opened up the door, I wouldn't have even had a bed to sleep in. So it was a real upgrade for me just to, just to go to church, you, you know. So I get that, I, but, but, but for the Apostle Paul and, and sometimes for other people, like what, what is it that would make a man that had his whole life mapped out for him? He had, he, he was trained, the Word of God says, by the greatest Jewish teacher of the day. He learned under the, the, t the Jewish sage Gamaliel and, 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 and historical books talk about Gamaliel and that he was the greatest teacher of that day. And Paul was trained under him and grew up under his teaching. And Paul was on a fast track to be one of the leaders of the, the sect of the Pharisees. In addition to that, the apostle Paul was a natural born Roman citizen. That may not mean a lot to us, but during that time frame, that was huge. Whenever he got uh, 
whooped and was thrown into prison that time. And he mentions to the jailer, he's like, are you sure you were supposed to do that? To a Roman citizen without a trial, and the and the jailer was like, "Well, what are you talking about?" He started to get all nervous, and he's like, "He's like, you're a Roman citizen." He said, "I had to pay a high price for that." And Paul said, "Yeah, but I was natural born because see, I was born in the city of Tarsus, and it's just like over here in America. If they make it over here and they're born on American soil, they're automatically considered a U.S. citizen, and that's how it was in the Roman Empire." And the Apostle Paul, he he had everything going for him, is what I'm trying to tell. He had money, he had prestige, he had power. And, and, and he traded that in for the life that we just spoke of. <laughs> I mean, he was shipwrecked and he was beaten and he was imprisoned. And listen, you know, they talk about muggings, right? I don't even know if they use that word anymore. Back whenever I was growing up, they had the word mug. You mug somebody on the street, right? You, you surround them, beat them up, take their money or something like that. And these days, people wanted their clothes. Clothing was, was scarce. And that's why he was talking about being naked. The, the robbers would wait in the rocks like whenever you come down from Jericho down towards Jerusalem. It was real rocky and the robbers would hide in there and they would mug these people and they would rip to steal their clothes. And he's saying that I was constantly in peril because he wouldn't let anything stop him. If he had friends to travel with him, I'm sure that he would travel with his friends. But if he didn't have any friends and he felt like he had to get to the next town to preach the gospel, I'm pretty sure that that's what he did. And he was left naked on more than one occasion and in the cold. What, what would drive a man to do this is, is, what I was, is what I was trying to wrap my mind around. I want to read to you real quick Acts chapter 9 verses 1 through 9 because this is where it all started for him. To give you a little bit of context before we get reading, the Apostle Paul is all that I said he was before he gave his heart to Christ. Fast track to success, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, tribe of Benjamin, he's got the pedigree. One, two chapters before this is the story of Stephen, the martyr. The word martyr, martyrio in the Greek means a witness, but, but more specifically, it, it's a witness, that, that it's taken on the connotation in Christianity that it's a witness that dies for his faith. And Stephen was one of the first deacons in the early church. And, and what ends up happening is, is that Stephen was a man that was full of the Holy Spirit. And he began to preach one day to the Jews. And he tells them the whole story going all the way back from Abraham. And he goes all the way through Moses. And then he gets to the end and he says, And you crucified the one that we were waiting on. And the Bible says that those Jewish people that he preached to, it says that they ran upon him and they gnashed him with their teeth. They grabbed a hold of him and they started biting him. And they were under a demonic influence. They began to bite him. And then the Bible says that there was a young man named Saul that was standing there watching the whole thing. And all of the men began to lay their coats at his feet and what that means is that he was the highest ranking official and that he was the only one that was able to give them the permission and by them laying their coats at some point in time he must have given the head nod because the Bible says they started to throw stones at Stephen and in the last moment before he died he was about to give way and the Bible says he says I see heaven open <laughs> and the son of man Standing yes. at the right hand yes. of, the, of the Father. And I remember I preached a message one time when Jesus stood. And because, see, the Bible teaches that Jesus, as high priest, when he offered himself as a sacrifice for sin, he sat down because the Old Testament priest could never sit down because their work was never completed because the blood of bulls and goats could not remove sin. So there was a constant offering of sacrifices. But Jesus, whenever he offered himself as a sacrifice, he sat down yeah. because his work was done. But on that day, he stood up. 
He stood up for Stephen. Amen. And I want you to know that the Lord is rooting you on too. And the Lord is rooting us on too. And he's saying, don't stop, child of God. Keep on going. If you've given your heart to me, if you would, if you desire to live for me, don't let the world have its way against you. Don't quit in the midst of the journey. Don't quit in the midst of the fight. No matter what you have to face as the days grow darker, hold on. And I'm telling you, man, Jesus stood up and he said, and, and he was, he was rooting him on. Amen. Amen. But that's where we are. We're in the, that, we're coming right off the heels of that. And the Bible says that after that happened, that, that Saul began to become even more in ang anger and he began to rip Christians out of their homes. And now he's on his way to Damascus to go find the leadership to get letters from them so that he can bring more persecution and torment on believers. Okay, so let's, let's start reading. Verse 1, it says, Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way. I want you to focus on those words right there, the way, for a moment, because Later on, it's going to, I'm going to bring some more scriptures in. But I want you to just notice that. So that if you found any belonging to the way. Are you part of the way tonight? Yeah. Are you part of the way tonight? Oh, because see, what he's talking about is those that have found the way, the truth, and the life. He, yeah. So he said, found any belonging to the way, both men and women, that he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus and suddenly... A light from heaven flashed around him and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city and it will be told you what you must do. The men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus, and he was three days without sight, and he neither ate nor drank. Think about that. Three days he couldn't see, and for three days he didn't eat or drink anything. Jesus said, why are you persecuting me? The word persecute means to make someone run or flee, to put them to flight. To drive them away. I mean, what are you talking about, Jesus? I thought the scripture said that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, that he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. But I need you to understand tonight this concept that in the mind of God, whenever his people are persecuted, that actually he is being persecuted. I want you to know that God makes a, made a way to where he can have an intimate relationship with you, that he can have closeness with you, amen, that he can be near to you, and that it's a very serious thing to the heart of God when his people are being persecuted because he's saying, if they persecute you, then they're persecuting me. John 14 and 23 in the King James Version is what I have right here. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man loves me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Yes, yes. <laughs> I wanted you to see that tonight, that if you are a child of God, if you have truly, if you have been converted, listen to me, I, I want to talk to you just for a second about this. It's so important that you understand what I'm saying. What does it mean to be truly converted? Well, this is the best thing that I know to tell you. First off, you had to hear the gospel. You had to hear the gospel tell you that you were a sinner in need of a savior. And then you had to believe that Jesus was the answer that you that for your sin. And that he had died on the cross and that he rose from the dead. And then you had to say yes. You had to say yes to God's plan. And when you said yes, if you meant it in your heart, then a miracle happened. And the miracle, and we're going to get into it, is that Jesus and his father made their abode with you. God's presence moved in on the inside of your heart. 
and on the inside of your life. It means that they came, God's presence came to live in you. Yes. And, and that's how you know if you've been converted because now God's presence lives in you. And if you will yield to that, then the Holy Spirit is going to lead you and guide you. See, you can have nearness to God. Amen. You don't have to be far away from God. And the more you listen to his voice and the more you respond and you let him draw to you, you're going to hear his voice more clearly. So if you're truly converted tonight, something has already started to happen in your life, depending on how long you've been in it. And what's been happening is that you're not you shouldn't still feel as comfortable doing everything that you were doing before. Amen. Amen. And, and listen, it's a process. It is a process, and we'll get into that in a little bit more, but that's one of the things I need you to know. If a man loves me, he will keep my words, my, and me, my father will love him, and we will come and we will make our abode with him. How does this happen? In verses 16 and 17 of John 14, it says, And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter that he might abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. Whom the world cannot receive because it sees him not, neither knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you, yes. and he will be in, in you. Yes, amen. Now, I don't want to overdo this, but I will say this, that, you know, who is the world versus who is God's people? Amen. The Bible calls the world Gentile sometimes. The Bible calls the world heathen sometimes. What does that mean? Can, can you go to Can you go to Romans chapter three real quick for me? Romans chapter three, and we're still in the King James version. Romans chapter three, verse one. I just want to listen. Most of you people already know this because y'all are Bible students, but let's just be thorough with this. Romans three, verse one. And I'm just trying to show you the difference between a Gentile or a heathen and 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 the people of God. Because see, the people of God started off with the Jewish people. So a Gentile nation is any nation that is not the Jewish nation. A heathen are peoples that come from nations that were not the Jewish nation because they worship pagan gods. They worship fallen angels and demon spirits. And so when the Apostle Paul writes the letter to the Roman church, he says right here, what advantage then has the Jew? Because he's explaining that both Jews and Gentiles now in the new covenant are guilty if they're not covered in the righteousness of God, which is Jesus Christ. But he, but he goes on to say this. So what is the advantage then of being a Jew? Or what's the profit of circumcision? And then look what he says. Much in every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. You know what an oracle is? It's a mouthpiece that speaks forth words. The Jewish people were God's oracle. They, they, they failed God miserably. Just like many Christians fail God miserably, but God's presence was with them. He gave them the prophets. He gave them the law. And they were an oracle on the earth proclaiming the truth of God in the midst of a lost and a dying world. In the midst of Gentile nations. In the midst of people that were heathen, that were worshiping false gods, that didn't know God. God's always had a witness yeah. in the land. Amen. To tell people the truth so that people can have access to the truth of God. And so I wanted you, I wanted you to see that, that that's the world. That's the difference between the world and the people of God. The world can't know him. John 14, 16. I'm going to pray to the Father. He's going to send you another comforter. And he's going to abide with you forever. But the world cannot receive him because they don't know him. He's the spirit of truth. He's the Holy Spirit. But he's been with you. See, Jesus right here, he's talking to disciples that are Jews. Then he says, he's been with you because the presence of God had been with the Jewish people. A pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. They had the oracles of God. They had the word of God. But he's going to be in you. Yeah. He's talking about whenever he goes to the cross. And that he fulfills the sacrificial system. The blood of bulls and goats could not remove sin. Jesus, see the whole time 
during that Old Testament, that Old Covenant, in the, in the Le Levitical sacrifices, whenever some of those sacrifices had fat, y'all remember that, right? And it, it had the fat, and the Bible says that the smoke would rise up into the nostrils of God, and it became a sweet-smelling yeah. savor. You know why it was a sweet-smelling savor in the nostrils of God? Not because he liked the smell of burning flesh, because it was a reminder to him that he had a plan of intimacy. Hallelujah. That he had a plan to draw man back and that yeah. he knew that That's this right. was representing the day that he would send his son yeah. because God yeah. so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That is the love of him. Yeah. That is the God of love. Yes. And he did all that for you. And he did it all for me so that we can have an intimate relationship. It doesn't matter what you've done. See, the devil wants to lie to us and say, oh, you messed up too bad this time. Oh, remember all that stuff from the past. I don't want to get ahead of myself. But that's the devil's job to, to tell you lies and to tell you that you messed up too bad. I'm here to tell you that you haven't messed up too bad. And that Jesus died for every sin, past, present, and future. And if you'll hold on to him and trust in him, hallelujah, it's all based upon Jesus' obedience. Amen. Amen. It says it right here, Jesus, I, I put it in my notes, Jesus made a way of intimate relationship. For you and I, look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7. If you could go back to the NASB, making you work hard tonight. <laughs> Hebrews 10, 7, the NASB. We read this the other day, at least in Bible study. Then I said, behold, I have come in the scroll of the book. It is written of me yes. to do your will, O God. <laughs> this, is, this is the psalmist prophesying that Jesus is saying this. Jesus is, is Jesus is saying, Behold, I have come in the scroll of the book, and it is written of me to do your will, O God. He says in, in another spot in this chapter, sacrifice and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. Jesus' body, there was a body prepared for him because see, God reached down and he formed Adam out of an un a earth that was not that did not have sin and he reached down and he touched him and he formed him and he breathed life into him and he was created in the image and likeness of God but sin marred the image and so God sent forth his only begotten son who is the, the he is the image of the invisible God and now in Christ, the Lord wants to form you and I and make us into the image of his son, Jesus. And it all starts with being born again. It all starts with true conversion. Then the Holy Spirit moving in. And then as we yield to him, he forms us and he fashions us into the image of Jesus. Yes, yes. Yes. His heart. He gives us his heart. Yes. Oh, thank you, Lord. In verse 9 of Hebrews 10, it says, Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. <laughs> that's, that's Jesus right there, man. Come on, Jesus. He came to do the will of the Lord. It says he took away the first. He's talking about the first covenant. So he could establish the second, the new covenant. Now look at this. And by this will. Whose will? The Father's will. We have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Man, if I could get somebody to... That's going to be too weird. I'm, yeah, I'm not even going to make anybody do it. I'm just going to put this chair over here. If I could get somebody to do it. Come on, Come on John. There you go. See, what happened was is this, is that I should have put you way back there, but then you'd be on the camera. What I did was I pulled him out. See, this represents the world right here. Numbers of people that are in the world. Yes. And whenever you got saved, you get pulled out. This is what the scripture says right here. It says, by this will. Whose will? The Father's will. What was the Father's will? To send His only Son to die for us. To establish the new covenant. And in the new covenant, the Holy Spirit can come to live in your heart. He said, by this will, we have been sanctified through the offering of Jesus Christ. Anybody know what the word sanctified means? Two, two things, huh? Made holy. Made holy. Separate. And separate it. He's made you holy because he put you in Christ, the Holy One. And he put Christ in you, the Holy One. And he separated you out. 
immediately when you got saved, you might not feel sanctified. You might be saying, oh, but I'm still doing this. No, 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 hold on. Sanctification is positional. He pulled you out of the world and he, and he put you separate. And that's what John represents. John represents being separated out from the rest of the world. Because the presence of God lives on the inside of you. Now I want you to know that as you partner with the Holy Spirit. As you partner with the Holy Spirit. And as you learn the word of God. And you allow the Holy Spirit to deal with you. That there's also a progressive nature to sanctification. There's an ongoing changing that's taking place. Where the Holy Spirit is molding you. Fashioning you into the image of Jesus, amen, where you're starting to look more like him and less like you, amen. Thank you, John. Praise God. Hallelujah. You've been sanctified through the sacrifice of his son. This is what I'm trying to explain to you right now is that this is how God did it. How did God do it? You were far away, but he brought you near. How did he do that? Be, by sending his son to pay the penalty so that you could be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus so that the Holy Spirit, the presence of God, could be placed on the inside of you and you could become one with him. Through the offering of his body as a sacrifice, he has prepared a way. Remember, I asked you to hold on to that thought and I asked you, are you part of the way? Amen. And I want you, he, he, he's prepared a way that the Holy Spirit can come to indwell in us. Jesus and the Father have come into us to make their abode with us. And once we are born again, we have become one with God. We become those of the way. And when someone persecutes us, they are persecuting Jesus. I'd like to talk to you momentarily about the way. I woke up this morning with two thoughts from my childhood. I know you don't really want to hear nothing about my childhood, but I'm using them as illustrations and I won't make it long. My mom probably doesn't remember this, but I woke up this morning thinking about this. We lived in Spring, Texas. I guess I was about six years old, I think, when we moved there. I didn't really ask her. And I think that I turned 10 in Singapore, so I'm guessing we were there for about two and a half, three years. I don't know how old I was, but we had a sunken den in Spring, Texas with a fireplace towards the back of that, that den area. And I can remember I was... I was running in the house playing. I had my socks on and I think I might have been running and I think I slid. And then all of a sudden I said, Mom! And she was probably up in the kitchen and there was like a little hole in, you know, like some uh, open area where she could hear me. She's like, what? I said, who's this man right here? I'm thinking that what caught my attention was that the man didn't have no clothes on. It was a statue. And he's sitting there like this. I said, Baba, who's this man? That's the thinker, Matthew. I said, well, what is he doing? He's thinking. Oh, and I just went on playing. I can remember it like it was yesterday. I couldn't have been but like seven years old. But from that day moving forward, every time I would see that statue, I would think he's thinking. And all of my life growing up, there was something that seemed important about thinking. Fast forward about six years, and I don't know the exact timing, but I'm pretty sure my mom and dad had gotten a divorce. She had already explained it to me that they were getting a divorce, and maybe my sister had already given her heart to the Lord. I'm not real sure about those circumstances, but I remember her giving me this little Catholic Bible, and on the cover of it, it said, you want to know what it said? The way. It said the way. And I don't know that I really even cracked the book open and read it, but I can remember being in my bedroom and looking at that and thinking, pondering, what does this mean? What, does, what, is, what is the way? What is that? What is, you know, what does that mean? And this morning, I'm telling you, it just hit me all over again. And, and, and these scriptures had this terminology about the way and that Saul was persecuting those that were of the way of Jesus 
teaches us, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. He said, if anybody tries to get in, he says, I am the door to the sheep, and if anybody tries to get in another way, he's a thief and a robber. And then, praise God, I'm, I'm here to tell you that God the Father made a way, and he sent his son. I think of John the Baptist, hallelujah. Yeah, I'm thinking that the religion, that the people of the day are like, John, we need some help down here. Religion has made it so that we don't even know the way. Yeah, we don't, yeah. And John the Baptist, I see him, he's like a man with a machete in his hand. Hallelujah. He's getting ready to go on an, ex, on an expedition. He's about to go off in a jungle. He's about to take that machete and he's about to start cutting a pathway because the king of kings is coming and he, he had a message. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Let the valleys come up. Let the mountains come down because the king is coming and religion has, has obscured the way. John the Baptist came to make a way for the way. Amen. Jesus said, I am the way. Yes. He said, he is the pathway. Yes. Jesus goes on to, he's having a conversation with his disciples in John 14. And he says, he says, I go to prepare a place for you. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know, Thomas said to him in verse 5, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said unto him, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. The way. <laughs> There's been times in your life you've been far away. There's been times that you were running and you were distant some of what she was saying and some of what she was talking about, she started to say it. She started to say, when I was running, you came and you got me. I didn't really know what I was talking about, but that's exactly what I've been thinking. Like, Lord, uh, how, why are you so good? Yes, yes. Why are you so good to somebody like me? You know, y'all think, oh, Pastor Matt, I don't know what you think about me, but I'm telling you right now, it probably ain't what you think. But I do know this. I know I love him, but he first loved me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He first loved me, and I need you to know that he loved you first. Yeah. And if you'll give him half a chance, he'll prove his love to you. Oh, hallelujah. Yeah. Listen, I'd like to talk to somebody that's, that's done went the wrong way before. I'd like to talk to somebody that's been down in the ditch before. I'd like to talk to somebody that's that been hanging around in the sewer for a little bit. And that the Lord went in and rescued them and pulled them out. Because once the Lord starts pouring his love on somebody like that, I'm telling you right now, that's going to be the next John the Baptist with a machete in their hand, clearing the way. You ain't got to do it tomorrow, my friend. You let the Lord do the work that he desires to do in you and you let him have his way with you. But when the time comes, you're going to know because he'll overwhelm you with his love. Hallelujah. And he'll, give, he'll teach you about intimacy. And he'll and while everybody else is saying that you're unworthy and they won't want to let you forget about your past, I wish it wasn't so, so church. I wish it wasn't so. They're not going to want you to forget your past, but I'm here to tell you the scripture said that he throws it into the sea of forgetfulness. He throws it as far as the east is from the west. Amen. God's so good. He put your sin on Jesus. God the Father ain't thinking about that no more. Don't let the devil keep making you think about that. But there was Paul three days without sight. He neither ate nor he drank. I asked the question earlier, I mean, what would cause a person to forsake their former life? I mean, it's one thing when it was like mine in shambles, but he traded. He traded, he, and he traded me beauty for ashes, but what about people like Paul? They had everything, like what? What happened? He knew. Oh, he was confronted, my friend. <laughs> he was confronted in another place. It's, he says I was apprehended. <laughs> yes, oh, yes. thank you, Lord. I wish I had some handcuffs because I'd apprehend somebody for an illustration. You ever been apprehended? Come on, tell me. I've been apprehended the wrong way. Paul was apprehended the right way. Oh, man. He was apprehended. Look at Philippians chapter 3, verses 8 through 15. I'm pretty sure this is the King James I got here. He says, Yea, doubtless, 
and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, yes. my Lord. You know, Amen. you know what one of our problems is? We over here trying to, we're trying to gain, gain. We're trying to gain. Can I tell you something that I've learned about myself? If I'm in the mode of trying to gain, I'm never happy. I'm telling you right now, I'm never happy. I, I've made, listen, I'm, I'm, I haven't made as much money as some of you, but I've made more money than a lot of you. And whenever I've made the most amount of money in my life, I wanted more. Yeah. You understand? I was trying to think, how am I going to get more? This isn't enough. Okay, because that was what I was being driven, and that wasn't that long ago. That was probably three years ago. I'm like, man, the Lord's blessing my hands. Oh, come on. Bring on the blessing, Lord. Open up the windows of heaven and pour me out a blessing that I'm not even able to contain. I've been paying my time. Now it's payday. Oh, but let me tell you something. I then got caught up in something that, that was that started to drive me and it was pushing me. And 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 my Lord was taking a back seat. My Jesus. Hey, look, if the Lord wants to bless you and he wants to put money in your pocket, praise God. Don't forget your Jesus. <laughs> Come on. And don't let it, oh Lord, let me be let me be careful not to go from preaching to meddling. All right, let's just keep it straight right here. He says that, he says, I have count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, yes, my Lord. Lord. The excellency of the knowledge of Christ yes. Jesus, yes. my Lord. Do you realize what, do you realize that you and I have a direct connect to the God of the universe. Do you believe that tonight? I'm talking about you got a communication line. Uh, look, they used to sing a song in the old church. I'm not going to try to get down the other door. Uh, yeah, I am too. Come on, Donnie. You can sing that old song. You heard that song? What was it? Jesus. Uh, Jesus. On Come on. You got me, Rich? Give me some mic right here. Jesus on the main line. Come on. You can do it. Sing it for me. <laughs> Jesus on the main line, tell him what you want. Come on. Jesus on the main line, tell him what you want. Jesus on the main line, tell him what you want. Jesus on the main line now. Come on. Call him up, call him up, tell him what you want. Come on. Call him up, call him up, tell him what you want. Call him up. Call him up, tell him what you want. Jesus on the main line now. Hallelujah. Yeah. I mean, you can't get more simple than that. I don't know what a musician thinks about that melody, but I'm trying to tell you, you can call up the Lord. You got a direct connect. You got a main line connection to the God of glory. Hallelujah. Do you believe that tonight? Yes. Test it. I dare you to test it. I dare you to talk to him tonight. <laughs> I dare you to bear your heart to him. To share your heartache and your pain with yes. him. I dare you to trust him enough to talk to him and to see if he won't respond to you. Oh, he wants to respond to you, church. The excellency of the knowledge of Christ. Is there anything better than that? No. <laughs> Money can't buy that, my friend. He says, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, but do count them as dung. <laughs> Y'all know what dumb is, right? Yeah. That I may win Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness, which is of God by faith. This is the part right here that was getting me, man, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Look at that. He can, in the same line, he connects the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings so that I could be made conformable to his death. The word in the Greek is symmorphous. To take on the same morphology, the same form, to be made conformable to his death. See, this earth, this world, this life is full of pain. 
I'm, I'm here to tell you right now, if you can't take the suffering of this earth out of the Christian experience and any preacher that tries to do that, I'm sorry, it's heresy. Yes. It's heresy. That's right. He is a blessing God. He is a loving God. He's our God of restoration and reconciliation. He is a God of healing. But I'm here to tell you right now, if all he ever did was heal and if all he ever did was bless, we would be so prideful and arrogant that we, would, he, we wouldn't even be, he wouldn't even be able to stand looking at us. And I'm here to tell you, praise God that he can look at us. You know why? Because of his humble son. <laughs> he clothed us with his humble son. Yeah. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to look like him. <laughs> Lord, please make me look like your son. I remember the first time I prayed that prayer. It was 20-something years ago. And he said, did you just pray that? Do you remember what they did to you? In other words, he's saying, do you understand what it takes to look like him? There's going to be pain. There's going to be heartache. But those sufferings of life, listen, you can I tell you a secret? Your wife ain't always going to treat you the way you want her to treat you. And your husband ain't always going to. And your friends and your mom and your daddy and your grandparents wow. and your boss and your best friend yeah. and your church friend. They're not all. But listen, those sufferings as you're going through that and you having to learn by the grace of God to die to yourself so that you can still love your brother and sister in the Lord. So you can still love your parents. So you can still love people that have hurt you. It's it's Forming you into the image of Jesus. You're being made conformable to his death so that you can be a partaker of his resurrection power. You're not going to walk in resurrection power unless you get made conformable to his death. Yes, yes, amen. yes. Amen. He's trying to get rid of us, my friend. Yes, amen. Because he wants to see Jesus amen. in us. Amen. I think it was Elena that told me that David Hernandez recently on one of his videos made a comment. He said, you know why you're going to be able to hear those words? Well done, my good and faithful servant, because you died. And when he saw you, he saw Jesus. That's good preaching right there, my friend, because Jesus is the good and faithful servant. Yes, yes. So the best thing we can do for the Lord is learn how to let him, let him put us to death so that Jesus can be seen in us. Sometimes it's painful. Sometimes it hurts. But if we'll trust him, I'm telling you, he's going to do a wonderful thing in our life. Amen. Verse 12 says, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after if that I may apprehend. Look at this. I need to apprehend, which means to seize something or take possession of. He says, I so that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. So what I'm, what I'm trying to say is, is this. The best way I know how to describe it is that on that day when the light hit him and he went blind, he didn't even know it. I don't know what he was thinking about for those three days when he couldn't see, when he wasn't drinking, when he wasn't eating. But you can't tell me that he didn't have the image of Stephen in his mind at some point in time in those three days. And he, and he realized that the Lord was saying, you're persecuting. You're kicking against what I'm trying to do. You're persecuting me. Saul, and, and, and he's sitting there thinking of that. And he didn't realize it at the time. He didn't know what God had planned for him on the day one. He didn't know what God had planned for him on day two. And he didn't know probably what God had planned for him on most of day three. But then Ananias, a faithful disciple of the Lord, showed up, laid his hands on him. He got filled with the Holy Spirit. Scales fell from his eyes. And he told him the things that he was going to have to suffer to bring glory to God so that the gospel could go to the Gentiles which is you and I, my friend, so that we can hear the good news of Jesus. Hallelujah. He said, I, he said, I got to apprehend that which I've been apprehended of. Yes, amen. Something apprehended me. I don't know. I don't, something happened. What happened? Uh, <laughs> what happened to you? You know? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. I know what you're talking about. Something got me. Some got me. I was one way one day. Hey, I was one yes, day one, one way one day. And then all of a sudden, every, everything changed. And it started turning around. A little bit at a time sometimes, but it started turning around. I ain't never going to be the same. I don't want to be the same. I ain't going back, you lying devil. Listen, what is that? Oh. 
When are them lies going to become disgusting? Yes, yes, when yes. is that old life going to be? I long for the day when I remember the things where I used to be bound by. And I, and I just, I'm getting there, my friend. I'm getting real close. This whole world is losing its glimmer. This whole world is not shining like it used to shine. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I love the sky, man. My mama taught me to love them clouds. Me and mama used to drive down there. Look at them clouds, Matthew. Look how beautiful that sky is. Sky's still pretty, mama, but them clouds are, they don't look quite as fluffy as they used to. And the sky doesn't seem quite as blue as it used to. Because I know that there's, God has prepared. Eye hasn't seen and ear hasn't heard nor has it entered into the heart of man. The things that God has prepared for those that love him. Don't trade in your eternal inheritance for this temporary world, my friend. He said, I got to grab a hold. Look at verse 14. He said, I press toward the mark of the, for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded. If in anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. When, you know what his prayer is? His prayer is, is that if there's something else in you that's trying to keep you from the high prize and the calling of the Lord, I, I want, I'm asking the Lord to reveal it to you. I would ask the Lord to reveal it to you, and I definitely want him to reveal it to me. Is there still something in here, Lord, that's trying to keep me from the high prize? Is there something that's trying to hold me back, Lord? Amen. I can only imagine the Apostle Paul in that man's house on a street called Straight. He didn't realize it yet, but his life was radically changed already. Hallelujah. You're going to live the rest of his life looking for this high prize. Yes. The calling, man. How you stop this man? What, what happened? Oh, intimate relationship. Have you ever felt like this before where your decisions have put you far away from the Lord? And, and sometimes his presence starts to feel distant. Yes. How do I get back, Lord? I want to tell you the scripture, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off have been made near by the blood of Christ. Hallelujah. You've already been made near. All you got to do is repent. All you got to do is get your heart right. Do business with the Lord. Amen. And you, and listen, it, he's, I promise you, he will not leave you. He's not going to leave you waiting and confused. Amen. Amen. I was going to close this out. Danielle, you still got that microphone? In a minute, not quite yet. I just put this right here. I'm going to get them to come up and sing. I'm sure that they come up with a song to close us out with. But before y'all do that, I just wrote in here, thank you for the blood. Can you say that with me tonight, saints? Thank you for the blood. Let's say it. Thank you for the blood, Lord. <laughs> thank you for the blood that draws me near. Oh. There were times I was so far away I could no longer feel your presence, but you didn't leave me there. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the blood that drew me near. I was going to ask Danielle real quick just to sing. I know it was the blood. Amen. Just sing that a little bit for me. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood for me. One day when I was lost, he died on the cross. I know it was the blood for me. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood for me. One day when I was lost, he died upon the cross. I know it was the blood for me.